Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship this morning here at St. Paul. It is the Sunday of the Transfiguration of our Lord. We always celebrate the Transfiguration at the end of the season of Epiphany. Epiphany, the revealing of who Jesus is to the world, to the nations. But now Jesus reveals who he is to his disciples in this unique way on the mountaintop. It's also always the Sunday before we enter into the season of Lent, as Jesus' ministry focus changes and fixes his eyes toward the cross. And so we'll see today, though, how Christ is transfigured before us, and we get to see who Jesus is for us. Let's stand and sing our first hymn today. O wondrous type, O vision fair, number 413. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This day ends the Epiphany season and prepares us for Lent. Jesus has been revealing his true nature through his words and actions. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, three disciples see his glory revealed in the strange and mysterious transfiguration. Moses and Elijah appear with him talking about his departure in Jerusalem. But our Lord would command the disciples not to tell about the event until after he has risen from the dead. Today, long after his resurrection, our Lord still reveals his true glory, as by faith in his word and sacraments we see and receive the assurance of sins forgiven, as our gracious God has not left us alone in our fallen state. Therefore, in repentant joy, in faith-filled confidence, we go to the throne of God's grace, confessing our sins. O God, our Father, we admit and confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We confess that we have not always brought glory to you through our words and our deeds. Mercy on us and us, 
We repent of all that is sinful in our lives, both that which we know and those things unknown to us that are against your righteous laws. You are a God of justice, yet you are gracious and wait to show us mercy. Our hope for daily and eternal forgiveness is secure in Jesus. For he who was transfigured is the one who was raised on the third day. Therefore, upon this your confession and by the command of our Lord, I as a called and ordained servant of Christ forgive you for all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. pray. Glorious God, on the mountaintop, you revealed your glory through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to his disciples, and you confirmed the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah. 
In the voice that came from the bright cloud, you wonderfully foreshadowed our adoption by grace. Mercifully, keep us as co-heirs with the one who would bring us to the fullness of our inheritance in heaven. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as we hear from God's word, and I invite Katie to come forward and share that with us. The Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 34, beginning at verse 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' was sh Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. This is the word of the Lord. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is the Lord. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called upon his name. They called to the Lord, and he answered them. And our epistle reading today comes from 2 Corinthians, from chapters 3 and 4. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, 
has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand as we hear the words of Jesus. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. As God the Father said, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves to pray. While Jesus was praying, he was transfigured before them. Behold, two men appeared before them in glory, Moses and Elijah. They were talking with Jesus and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. The disciples were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory. Peter did not know what to say, for they were terrified. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and they heard a voice from the cloud. When the disciples heard this, they were terrified and fell face down to the ground. And when the voice had spoken, they lifted up their eyes and found Jesus alone. But he came and touched them and said, As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated as we sing.
Transfiguration Sunday. We can almost picture Jesus, Moses, Elijah, all shining in glory. Moses and Elijah because of the glory they have in heaven. Jesus because of the glory of God himself. An amazing event, right? A powerful event, right? This event, the Transfiguration, is probably one of the first for the church that we would call and, and through the centuries since then call, we'd all love to have, what, a mountaintop experience, right? That's what it's all about, mountaintop experiences. Well, I will say that this event had a big impact on Peter, James, and John. Peter would write in his second epistle later, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven. For we were with him on the holy mountain. You can almost hear the power of this event for Peter. John, in his gospel, first chapter, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And in his first epistle, again, in the first chapter, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest. We have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. For both of these men, the Mount of Transfiguration, in a very real sense, solidified their faith in a way that they were willing to go from there, proclaim the gospel, suffer persecution, be executed for their faith, standing firm that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And nothing could deter them from that message. Nothing could deter them from that faith because they had seen it. They had seen Jesus in all his glory. A true mountaintop experience. Wouldn't you love to have one like that? Except, I wonder. Because when it was going on, when that mountaintop experience was happening, it wasn't so great for Peter, James, and John, really. Think about it. We're told that Jesus led them up a high mountain. Now, I don't know whether there was a trail or whether they had to climb the mountain. I don't know. But whichever way, they had to go up what is declared to be a high mountain. And by the time they got to the top of that, by the time they struggled up that mountain, they were exhausted on top of that mountain. Why do you think they had a problem staying awake? Oh, they were exhausted by the time they got up there. In fact, they were so exhausted, they fell asleep, and they almost missed the whole transfiguration. Jesus, while he's praying, his countenance changes, his clothes change. Moses and Elijah show up. I don't know whether the conversation Moses and Elijah and Jesus are having is what woke them up or, or what, but something woke them up and all of a sudden they're looking and here standing before these are these three guys shining in glory. 
two guys who are supposed to be dead. And Jesus in the glory. And what does it say? What was the reaction of the disciples, Peter, James, and John? They were what? Terrified. They weren't going, oh, wow, how great. They were shaking in their boots, folks. They were terrified at what was going on. Now, I don't know whether they heard what, what the three of them were talking about, this departure in Jerusalem that was going to happen. I don't know whether they, they heard the conversation or not, but they sure didn't understand it if they did. We know that because as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus says, don't tell anybody about this until after the Son of, uh, the Son of Man has been risen from the dead. And the next verse says they were going, they went down puzzled. What did he mean by risen from the dead? You know, they, they didn't understand what was, what they were talking about, what was going on there. This was confusing to them. And then that cloud shows up. And it's not fluffy white little clouds that we see floating across the blue sky. It's not even a dark thundercloud coming over. This is the cloud of God's glory. And all of a sudden their terror is at an even greater level. We are told that they are falling down on the ground on their face. You know, you almost get the picture. They're down there going. <laughs> they're scared to death. A mountaintop experience? This is terrified. Then to hear the voice of God, this is my beloved son in whom I will please. Listen to him. They don't know what to do with that. They don't know what to do. Peter's sitting there and says, because he's terrified, he, he just throws out an idea. Let's make some, tem some tents. Now, I don't know whether the tents he was talking about was a place to stay or whether they were little shrines to Moses and Elijah and Jesus. I don't, you know, but it doesn't make any difference. Peter didn't know what he was saying either. He was terrified. He's just trying to, to say something in the midst of this. Confused. They're sitting there on the ground shivering in terror. And Jesus comes over and touches them. Don't be afraid. And they look up. There's no more Elijah and there's no more Moses. No more shining glory. There's no more cloud. There's no more voice of God. There's just Jesus standing there normal. And I wonder if what passed with the mind is, did this really just happen? Did I dream this? What's going on here? It wasn't until much later, as they reflected back on what happened on that mountain, that the reality set into them. I think that's true because look at what happens after this. They come down off the mountain, they go into Jerusalem, and what happens? Peter will still deny Jesus. These same three disciples who were sleeping while Jesus was praying on the Mount of Transfiguration do what in the Garden of Gethsemane? The same thing. Those three disciples are still sleeping on Jesus. What effect did the Transfiguration have on them? And I wonder, I really wonder as John stood at the foot of the cross and saw the beaten, bloody, crucified, thorn and crowned head of Jesus and compared that vision of Christ with the one from the Mount of Transfiguration, which one stuck in his head? 
Which one was the one that had the greatest effect on him at that point? A mountaintop experience? I'm not sure I'd want one of those like that. Like that Mount of Transfiguration. So what's the point? I think the point lies in the words of God on that mountain. That's the key to the Mount of Transfiguration. Not the shining and glory and everything else, but the words of God. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. This is Jesus. This is God. This is the Son of God himself. This is who Jesus is. That's what God declares there. This is who this Jesus is that you've been walking for three years with. This is the Son of God himself. You need to know that. And you listen to him. God knows that there's going to be a lot of voices to come in the lives of these disciples. There's going to be all kinds of yelling and persecution, there's going to be trials, there's going to be temptations, there's going to be all kinds of things to draw them away from Jesus, and he wants them to know Jesus is the Son of God, he's that Savior, the one who was to come, and you listen to him and him only. Because you see, when the transfiguration is all over and they look back up, what do they see? Only Jesus. And that's what God wants. Them to see only Jesus and to listen to him. He's the only one that's going to bring salvation. He's the one that's going to suffer and die to take away their sin. He's the one that's going to rise again so that they can have eternal life. He's the one that they will proclaim for the rest of their life to the whole world that continues to even today. It's all about Jesus. Who he is, what he did, and you listen to him. You don't listen to the voice of temptation that comes from Satan. You don't listen to the voices of the world around you. You don't listen even to that small voice that's inside you that wants to follow them temptations in the world. You listen to Jesus. And I think that's the true point, the true reality of the Mount of Transfiguration. Know who God is and or who Jesus is and listen to him. Amongst all the other voices that are out there, listen to him. Because he's the Savior. And I think today, do you want a mountaintop experience with God? You realize you've already had one, right? Right there at the baptismal font. When God touched you with his glory, washed you clean of your sins, and made you his child. That's a mountaintop experience. You come to the Lord's table, and you eat, and you drink the very body and the very blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in all of his glory as the risen one who forgives your sins. That's a mountaintop experience as you come in intimate contact with your Savior Jesus. You want to hear the voice of God declare, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him and open your Bible and let God speak to you every day. That's a mountaintop experience. You want to know what Jesus says? You want to actually listen to him? Then read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest those scriptures, the word of God. 
because that's Jesus speaking to us, even today. That's the mountaintop experience. It isn't in shining bodies and raised dead and all of that stuff. The mountaintop experience is knowing who Jesus is and listening to his voice. And God has given us the ways to do that. Worship, devotions, Bible study, sacraments, word. The mountains all around us and with us every day. Truly, Transfiguration Sunday opens our eyes to see Jesus and listen to him. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds where? In Jesus. Amen. Let us rise, join together in our response. We join together and confess our faith in how God has revealed himself to us using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please be seated as we worship with our offerings. We gather those so they may be used to proclaim Christ here in this place and out into our community and to the world. I also ask that you'd grab the black folders that are on the inside of the pews here. Let us know that you're here today and how we can continue to be in contact and connection with you.
We're going to have uh, infant faith chest milestone at this service also alongside our 1045 service this morning, but uh, families notified us that they couldn't make it this morning, possibly because of some sick kiddos. So uh, we'll continue to pray for them and the way that God continues to help them raise their little ones in the faith and pray that God blesses those families that will gather at 1045 as well. Please stand as we pray. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the eyes to see, the ears to hear, and the faith to believe Christ is the glory of the Father who has accomplished salvation by fulfilling the law and the prophets for us. Lord, in your mercy. For the church where the glory of God shines through the voice of his word, by the sacraments of Christ, and for the life together in the unity of this word believed and this gospel proclaimed. Lord, in your mercy. For the pastors who preach the glory of the cross, and the church workers who also serve in Christ's name, and for those preparing for church work. Lord, in your mercy. For the faded glory of the world, nations in conflict, the victims of violence and hate, and the inequalities of our broken world, and for those who serve us in every level of government, Lord, in your mercy. For our wisdom in the face of falsehood, our strength in the face of temptation, and our courage in the face of threat and persecution, Lord, in your mercy. For those afflicted in mind or body, those bearing the pain of grief or loss, and for the dying. Today we especially remember those who are in the hospital and are in need of healing. Evelyn and Donnie Jo. We pray for Jan and her upcoming surgery. Pray that many would receive recovery and healing, like Rachel, Tyler, Rosemary, Barb, and Wanda. May you daily watch over Ernest and Andrew, Luella, Sally, Jim, Mike, and Gordon, Bill, Shirley, Steve, and Kristen. That you would continue to bring strength and healing to those with cancer. Greg, Leo, Beth, Harry, Dale, and Wanda. Eric, Virginia, Ken, Shireen, and Stephen, Patty, Deborah, Emily, Nancy, and Tyler. And you would hold up and lift up Eunice in hospice care. Bring comfort, peace, healing, and faith to sustain them in their trouble. Lord, in your mercy. For each of us, that we may shine with the borrowed light of Christ, displaying in words and works the love that Christ has manifested toward us. Lord, in your mercy. For faithful worship, where Christ and his gifts are the center of why we gather and all we do. For the grace to receive his gifts with faith and repentance. Lord, in your mercy. For families who are expecting children, and for families raising little ones in the faith. Lord, bless these children and their families as these little ones begin to hear of your love for them. Strengthen their parents as teachers and examples of righteousness for their children. Bless their devotion and prayer time at home. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for Reverend James and his family during this time of discernment as we have issued him a a call to serve as our senior pastor. Bless him as he serves in his current congregation and as he attempts to discover through prayer and through the work of your spirit whether he is being called to now serve here. Lord, give him peace, give him clarity, help him to know your will. Lord, in your mercy. 
Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Shortly after his transfiguration, Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem, where he would spend the last days of his life before being crucified. This day marks the end of the Epiphany season, when on Ash Wednesday we begin our season of Lent, a time of reflection, meditation, repentance, and prayer. In our observance of Lent, we voluntarily give up the word Alleluia in our worship until the celebration of our Lord's resurrection on Easter. Therefore, we bid farewell to this word as we also set our faces toward Jerusalem. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. As we head out today, and as we lean into the season of Lent, there are a few resources for you to pick up on your way out, especially there's a bunch on the counter over here. Uh, there is a booklet of devotions, Lenten devotions, daily devotions that you can uh, grab and, and use daily. We also are going to be sending those out uh, through our e-news, maybe you've seen them already, that you can access electronically if you'd like to do that daily. There's a postcard also that you can pick up, and on the back it has all of our service times for the Lenten season, Holy Week, and Easter, so you can uh, plan on that. You can pop that in your Bible or put it in, uh, on your refrigerator and keep note of uh, those special services coming up. Uh, especially this upcoming Wednesday, we have uh, our Ash Wednesday services. Uh, we'll gather with kids uh, at our chapel service at uh, 8.25 a.m. at the school. And uh, we'll have imposition of ashes uh, with the kids there. We offer it to them there. And then we'll have two services uh, here at this space, uh, 12.10 a.m. 
here, um, and then also at 7 p.m. And before the 7 p.m. service, we're going to be having soup suppers again. So uh, plan on gathering for those as we, uh, as we spend time together in Lent. Um, let's see, I think I had one more announcement. Oh yes, after a service, like uh, normal, we'll have uh, uh, people uh, pray with you if you'd like to offer, uh, have any prayers for yourselves or others that you'd like uh, someone to gather with you with in prayer. Then we have our elder uh, Brent is here today and one of our Stephen ministers, Peggy, is also going to be up here after the service for prayer. So I invite you to join in prayer with them. God be with you and we pray with you that uh, you would have uh, an understanding of the mountaintop experiences that Christ has already given to you and also uh, daily walk with him in those rich blessings that he shares with you every day. We go in the name of Jesus as we sing our final hymn together, Swiftly Past the Clouds of Glory, number 416.